officially, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024, where you're going to freeze your tails off this week. I just know, it's, ooh, it's going to get cold. So hopefully you're ready for that. Uh, I hope your new year is going off really well, because it is for me, my Huskies. They did it. They barely did it. It was the most agonizing 30 minutes, you know, at the end of that game uh, to be able to do. I had some fun with some family and friends. And yes, I got my dog. He was not very happy about that, uh, you know, but hey, you got to do what you got to do. So one more. Can they do one more? You know, and if not, it's okay. But I want them one more. It's been since 1991. I was telling my boys, I said, I was in high school. And they're just like, you're old. And I said, yes, I am. Uh, now, I, I can't. Also, I need to mention Montana Grizz. 11 o'clock, going also for a national championship. So I just want to encourage you in that because I got reprimanded on Thursday for not mentioning it. So you are welcome. Uh, also, as uh, Gretchen mentioned, I wanted to update you on Joy to the World. Last week, we mentioned that uh, over $280,000 came in, and we were so excited to celebrate that. But something happened this last week because now over $360,000 have come in. Isn't that amazing? I'm just like... Unbelievable. And you just think about the impact generationally that's going to happen in the Philippines and Uganda and in the Middle East, Christ-centered people, not only telling people about Jesus, but also changing generations, and you and I get to be a part of that. And you might think, well, I only gave a few dollars. Yeah, but when several thousand people come together and give a few dollars, it adds up. And so just thank you, you know, for just being generous people. I, I, just, I just marvel uh, at the generosity of this place. And uh, I, just, I just love being a part of it. And so just thank you for being a part of this. And you'll get updates you know, over the course of the next year and so on you know, as we get to update you on what God's doing around the world. So welcome to our new series, The Book of Revelation. Uh, Dear Church specifically, and today, uh, I just want to prep your minds. It's going to be a lot more teaching than preaching. So um, I've got to give you a lot of context, a lot of background, so that we can understand what we're walking into. And so I know you can handle it, and for some of you who've been Christians for a while, uh, it's going to be some new information that you maybe have never heard before. So just hang in there, because we're going to go through the entire chapter of Revelation chapter 1. So let's just jump right in. Uh, Revelation 1, verse 1, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. Now, that uh, ancient word for, that we translate into revelation is actually a Greek word that gets translated to apocalypse. So the literal meaning of apocalypse is a revealing or an unveiling. So this is a revelation, a revealing or unveiling from Jesus Christ, and as we're about to find out, to his churches. Now, churches is not just a, it's not a building, it's the people of God that he's going to write to at these specific places, but it's also for us as well. So let me just uh, kind of walk through some of this together. It says, he sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John. Now, that is not John the Baptist. This is John, one of uh, Jesus' followers. He calls himself the one whom Jesus loved, and, which is always a funny thing to describe yourself when you describe yourself that way. He wrote the book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as Revelation, uh, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, that's how we know it's to, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. So it's not just hearers of the word, but actually doers of the word is where the blessing comes from, for the time is near. Now, that time is near can mean a couple different things. The first is, again, he's writing to seven specific churches, and what he's about to reveal to them is saying, this is about to happen, the time is near. But more often than not, when the phrase, the time is near or the time is about to take place, it's referring to the end times. Now, the end times is the second coming of Jesus. Some of you may not be familiar. Jesus was prophesied. At the Old Testament, they thought he was only going to come once, but we realized he's supposed to come twice. The first one we just celebrated just a little over a week ago with the birth of Jesus as he came into the world, raised up, died on the cross, rose again, and then ascended to heaven, and then he's going to come back a second time. And so we know that the time is near is most likely in, in indicating the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, when is that going to happen? I can tell you that we're a lot closer now than we used to be. But a day is like a thousand years to God. So it's already been 2,000 years since this book has been written, specifically the book of Revelation. And so if it's been 2,000 years, how much longer? Now, 
Here's an indication that we know that the time is short. Jesus himself says in Matthew 24, verse 14, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So here's what you need to know, because people have said this before, is that there's like 4 billion, 5 billion people who have not yet received Jesus. And you might hear a phrase, unengaged, unreached people groups, as if that's an indication of the delay of Jesus Christ, and it's just not. It doesn't say those who receive Jesus, and all it says is those who hear the message of Jesus. And in our day and age, studies have actually shown through the efforts of missionaries, our technological advancement, and that we're concentrated in areas and places where people have never heard the message of Jesus. Get this, they estimate that sometime in the next 20 to 50 years, that's going to happen. So the time is near. Uh, We knew the time was near when Israel became a state in 1948. That that was starting a clock, you know, of another of the prophecies of what's to come. And that's all to say, not to scare us, but how does that change our mindset? How does it change the way we live if we believe that Jesus is going to come sometime in our lifetime? So just as we process going into 2024, that's just what I just kind of want us to process as we look at this letter and as we look at at what John's about to write. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Now, so it's important to know that I got a chance to visit these places. It was an incredible trip that I got to go on this uh, a year and a half ago in 2022. And so I'm going to be able to present to you some things that I actually got to see firsthand, show you some pictures, you know, and walk through some of the stories as well. So I'm so excited to be able to share that with you over these next few weeks. Uh, then it goes on to say this, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. That word seven is important because the word seven in the Bible represents perfect or completion. So we just need to understand that word seven is mentioned quite a bit through the book of Revelation. He, Jesus, is the faithful witness, I mean John, is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, which he's actually talking about Jesus, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. So he's saying that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, and so you need to understand he's the one that we're looking to. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. The reason Jesus had to die on the cross is our sin had to, had to have a punishment. If God's gonna be a righteous judge. He doesn't just say, oh, it doesn't matter. So there had to be a consequence. There had to be, you know, the shedding of blood. And instead of animal sacrifice, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, Jesus was called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We put our trust in him. We get a chance for our sins to be forgiven. And because he rose from the dead, a chance at abundant life as well as eternal life. Okay. Then it says, he has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his father, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. It says, look, here comes, he he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. So in Acts, Jesus raises from the dead, but you notice he doesn't die the second time. He raised from the dead and then he meets with the disciples and then he's, it's called the ascension. He's taken up where his disciples literally watch him go up to the clouds. And then the angels say, hey, why are you staring up at the clouds? Because, but understand that he's going to come back the same way that he, that he left. So we know that Jesus is going to come back, and the world's going to know, either through our technological advancement or everybody's going to be able to see all at one time. But that's how Jesus is actually coming back. And then it says, even though who pierced him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, so in other parts of scriptures, it says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. So whether you're against Jesus or for Jesus, the response to Jesus' return is gonna awaken you to, oh my gosh, he really is who he says he was. And now he's coming as king and he's coming as judge. He says, I am the alpha and the omega. What does that mean? Good thing it tells us. The beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was and who is still to come, the Almighty One. Then it says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering in God's kingdom and in his patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. What John is saying there to these churches is they're going through tremendous persecution, tremendous suffering, unlike anything that any of us have ever experienced simply because they've chosen to follow Jesus. And what he's saying is, I'm with you. You're not alone in this. I write to you as a fellow person who is suffering for the same things that you're suffering. Now, John's story is a little crazy 
Because here's what we know is, and we'll talk more about this next week, but the Caesar, uh, the ruler of Rome at the time is Domitian. And Domitian decides to go after this cult of Christianity. And so he takes John as one of the examples and gets this whole vat of hot oil and he throws John to die in the hot oil. Now, according to history, is we understand that he actually was completely unscathed. Like, not a single mark was on him. They didn't know what to do with him. Because, like, wait, wait, we just tried to kill him, and the guy survived. So think of those of you guys who know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown in a fiery furnace. They didn't even smell like smoke, and they walked out. Same thing happened to John. So, like, what do we do with this guy? Like, well, since we can't kill him, let's at least put him on a penal uh, criminal colony, you know, uh, um, uh, not too far from us, and we'll have him do hard labor. And that's where we find John actually writing this book in Revelation to which he's encouraging these churches. Okay, so with that as the background, it goes on to say this. It was the Lord's day, uh, and I was worshiping in the spirit, John says, so we know it's either Saturday, or Sabbath day. And he says, suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now the reason that's important is because you need to understand this is in modern day Turkey. These places exist. Because sometimes people look at the Bible and like, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of made up stories. No, archaeological evidence shows without any doubt, nobody can say that these, these cities, these seven cities are there, and you can actually tour all of them and even see the different churches that John writes to, which gives us even more confidence that our book is based not only in faith, but based in history, based in science, and based on archaeological evidence. And every time they do a dig, they find more and more that supports what's actually in the Bible. And then it says this, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. Now, these lampstands could have been menorahs. They could have been these single lampstands. But the flame represents God's Holy Spirit that represents himself in these churches. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He's describing Jesus. Okay. Now, if I were to ask you to picture in your mind what is the picture that you think of when I say picture Jesus? If you were to close your eyes and say, what's the image that comes to mind? When you're praying to Jesus, when you think of Jesus, what is that? Like when I was a kid, uh, I, I kept thinking of, of, of uh, Jesus. I'm like, okay, oh well, yeah, he's the guy that has the lamb on his shoulders and he's all happy and for some reason he's white. You know, I don't know why. You know, we got, we got it right as we got older because he's actually Jewish and means he's darker skin. But that's a picture I have. You know, others of you have different pictures. In fact, if you're more of a recent follower of Christ, this is probably your picture. Yeah, the chosen this is what you think Jesus looks like. So this is Jesus, you know, to you, okay? And you, you read about Jesus, you read about the baby Jesus, and you read about Jesus growing up and dying on the cross, and that's a great image of Jesus. And yet now, we're gonna get a different picture of Jesus. This is the picture of Jesus. Yeah, something out of Lord of the Rings. I'll tell you that right now. And so you look at that Sodomon or Gandalf the White, you know, I don't know what you actually look at that, and you're just like, what? This is what Jesus looks like to John. And this picture that we're about to go through, that John describes in what he sees, has some great significance and meaning. For John says, he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. Now, we understand based on the book of Daniel, who also has visions of Jesus at the end times, it's also what's called apocalyptic literature, just like Revelation, that he also has similar visions, and we understand this, that the robe that Jesus is wearing and the sash are garments in those day and age of a judge and a king. So what he's saying is that here is the judge and here is the king that is now being presented to the world. Then it says, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Here's what we know about Daniel when he describes the hair of Jesus. He attaches another name that describes his hair called Ancient of Days. And when Daniel describes him as Ancient of Days, what that means is Jesus is so old in a good way that he was actually existed before time. So he was, he is, and he will be. He always has been. And that's the significance of his hair. Then it says, and his eyes were like flames of fire. Fire in the Bible it has to do with refinement and purification. 
And so that's what he's doing when he's looking. He's refining the churches and the people, and he's purifying it. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. Now, bronze in the Bible represents judgment. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves, majestic and powerful. This is not a meek, weak Jesus that you are now getting a chance to see. And so if you go back to this, uh, oh, and his face was like the sun. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a part. He says, he held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. So what it's, that indicates, and we can go back to you know, Ephesians chapter six, is that that's indicating the word of God. That when Jesus speaks, he's, he is God and he is speaking the word of God and he represents God himself, which God's word pierces our hearts as well as our minds. And then it says, and his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. So if you go back to this picture, what would your response be? If all of a sudden you turned around, trumpet blast, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, what would your response be? Well, I would think your response would be just like Christmas Eve, oh holy night, fall on your knees. That is a different Jesus than the, usually the Jesus we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And funny, that's what John's response was. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Just let that sink in for just a second. That's who we're worshiping. That's who we're talking about as we go through the book of Revelation and as we understand Jesus a little bit more. And then he says this, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. Revelation can be very confusing because you read through like, what does this mean? What does this look like? And yet John just tells us from Jesus how to understand this book. He says, write down what you have seen, which is what he were doing in chapter one. And he says, both the things that are now happening, which is what chapters two and three are about, and the things that will happen, which is what chapter four is through the rest of the book. So we're gonna center our time more in chapters two and three because they call that the church age. The age in which Jesus talks to the church isn't just to the seven churches. It's written for all time for all churches and all people in these churches to hear, to receive, and to apply, which is what we read when we first started this passage in Revelation chapter 1. So it's for all followers of Christ. So you and I live in the time that is now but not yet. The not yet time is the time of prophecy when Jesus is gonna come actually again. And for those of you who can't wait for us to get to chapter four, I'm sorry, we're not gonna get there. You're gonna need to do that one on your own because there's so much that's in there. We're gonna focus in because we live in this time, the church age. And I want you to take encouragement as we go into 2024, knowing that Jesus may come back sooner than what we think. That are we ready for his return? And he's got some things to say to people in the church age, which is you and me, which is what we're gonna go through these next five weeks. Now, then he finishes with this. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand. So you notice I kind of skipped that at first. And the seven gold lampstands, because Jesus tells us what it means. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, that word angel literally is translated in the Greek messenger. So is it like an angel that's overseen? We don't know. It could be actually the pastors, you know, that are leading this, these churches. Uh, either way, we know that God is overseeing these churches, that they're his churches, they're not ours, and that we get to be a part of his leading and his guidance. So we're gonna spend these five weeks looking of what we can learn as individuals as well as a church as we go into 2024, because here's what's crazy. In a few hundred years from this writing, these persecuted believers change an empire in less than 250, 300 years. What happened? What did they do? And so we're gonna see that as we go through it, but there's two questions that I want us to answer as we go through this series. Number one, what is God trying to tell us as a church? What is he saying? Because there are things that we're supposed to learn that we're supposed to apply as a church. And that can be almost the easier part. You might be able to sit back and be like, yeah, yeah, Valley of Real Life, we really need to grow in that. And you'd be right. You know, or, hey, man, we can take encouragement that we're really doing well in this area because that's what he does when he writes to the churches. He most often, he says something that's good, but then something he needs to encourage us with. And so we're gonna look at that. But here's the one I want you to focus on as well. 
If Jesus were to write a letter to you today, what would it say going into 2024? What would it say? Because he would always have something encouraging. That's what, we, that's what we realized, is that he was something, this is what you're doing well, great job, want to encourage you in this, but here's an area to grow in. Here's an area I want to challenge you in. And so I want you to take this personally, because it's easy to say, well, the church, without saying, no, no, I am part of the church. What is God challenging me as part of the church to be able to grow in in 2024? So let's back up just a little bit. With the time that I have left, that's kind of the teaching part, but I want to give you a little bit more. Uh, because there's a phrase that he says that God revealed and opened my eyes to this week that I want to focus in on, and that's in Revelation 1, verse 6. I went right through this where he says this. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God and his Father. I don't know if you've ever thought of yourself this way, but as followers of Jesus, we, you, are a kingdom of priests. In fact, this is a theme that we see throughout the whole Bible, when God chooses the nation of Israel to be his people and he was gonna be their God, he says, I'm gonna give you guys a title as well and you're gonna be a kingdom of priests. In Exodus chapter 19, verse six, he says to the nation of Israel, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. So with the opportunity and privilege comes a responsibility as part of God's people. In the New Testament, we get adopted into the family of God, and it's fascinating what we are also called in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple now. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices to God. So we, as a priest in the Old Testament, used to offer physical sacrifices, animal sacrifices. Now you get to offer spiritual sacrifices, but I need you to sit back and process this. You're a priest. Bet you didn't think about that. Some of you guys are like, that's not what I signed up for. Sorry. You know, that is actually one of your identities is you're a child of God, but you're also a priest for God when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I need to unpack what that means. But look at the verse 9 in 1 Peter 2 as well. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. So let's talk about what does that mean? What does it look like to be a priest today? And again, if you're a follower of Christ, both men and women, this is what you are. And maybe it's the one takeaway from today to be like, ooh, I've got to really think. I'm not just a Christian. I'm actually a priest. And what does that look like as I live for him? Well, here's what a priest does. Let me make it as simple as possible. A priest connects with and represents God in word and deed. A priest connects with God and represents God in word and deed. Let me be specific. A priest represents God in word by deed by going to God on the behalf of others. A lot of times we think, and we're not wrong, that Jesus died so that we could have direct access to God, which is true, but do you understand that as a priest, he's actually called us to go to God on behalf of other people because that's what priests did in the Old Testament, that's what we're called in the New Testament. Let me show you. 1 Timothy 2.1, Paul writes, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. So start thinking about your prayer life. How often do you pray to God on behalf of other people? Uh, let me put you another challenge for you. If you are a follower of Jesus and you call this your church home, why would you ever let a service go by and not give a prayer request that you're prompted to every single week on behalf of somebody else? Why would you ever leave and take that two seconds that it takes to do the QR code and actually submit a prayer request on behalf of other people? Because God works through prayer and you're the mediator between other people and God as his priest in this world. So that might be one of the challenges you know, for you and for me as we go into this new year. But then you notice that I mentioned earlier that it reads that we're supposed to bring spiritual sacrifices. So we don't do the animal sacrifice. What does it mean to bring a spiritual sacrifice if you and I are priests? Romans chapter one tells us the first thing. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. 
Let them be a holy and living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship God. Do you understand that when you say, Jesus, you're my Savior and Lord, what you're saying is, God, my life is yours. I am sacrificing myself for you because you sacrificed yourself for me. I am a living sacrifice. Your will, your way, my life sacrificed to you. That's our prayer going into 2024. To say, God, I want your will. I'm gonna be a living sacrifice to you. That's what it means for us to sacrifice on behalf of other people. Secondly, Hebrews 13, 15, it says, therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Now, some of you guys may have never thought about this. Why? Here we are in 2023. Do we sing every single weekend? And why do we do that? This is why, because we're not singing. You're bringing a sacrifice to God, a spiritual aroma that he finds pleasing when we worship him specifically in this way through song. I bet you never realized that when you're singing, you're not singing, you're bringing a sacrifice to God in the same way they brought animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. You get a chance to share your allegiance to God by singing. But Dan, I don't like to sing. Let me see. Nope, doesn't say that. It's, and it doesn't matter whether you can sing, whether you're good at it, whether you're uncomfortable with it. God says, you're a priest, and as a priest, you get to bring sacrifice yourselves, and your worship is actually a sacrifice. Now, here's what's crazy to me. Is, one, Christmas Eve is my favorite time of the year. Want to know one of the reasons why? Because y'all get here like 30 or 45 minutes before service. It's weird and awesome. You're like, I gotta get my seat. I don't wanna miss a seat. So you line up 30 minutes. And those of you guys are like, I don't line up 30 minutes. Yeah, that's why you were in overflow. You know, so we understand. <laughs> so people get here early because like, I just gotta be here. Why? What's the big rush? What's the big special? Well, because it's something special. Isn't that every week? I mean, what if every week you made a decision as a priest, as a man or a woman who's a priest, that you said, you know what? I'm coming to bring a sacrifice. I'm not gonna judge whether I like the songs or not because it's not about me. It's not about the worship team. It's about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and I'm charged to bring a sacrifice to him. So you know what I'm gonna do in 2024? I'm gonna get my coffee ahead of time. I'm gonna get my kids checked in ahead of time. I'm gonna get to church 15 minutes early. I'm gonna come to the front row and I'm going to be so excited that I can't wait for that first note to happen, that first song to engage in, whether I know the song, because it's not about me, it's about him. What an opportunity, right? And I get it. Not everybody likes to sing, but now you can think, well, wait a minute. It's not about me, about Jesus, and I'm bringing a sacrifice according to God's word as a priest. So maybe that's another New Year's resolution, we might say. And don't, don't forget, the second part of that verse is, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God, which leads us into the second part of being a priest. First, we get to go to God on the behalf of others. That's a mindset shift. Secondly, we are going now to others on behalf of God. That's what a priest does. So we, we serve and we love and we take care of. In fact, Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter five. This is what priests do. You, as a priest, are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot and worthless. Do you know what a salt does? It enhances, it preserves. And that's what it did in that, in that culture. They didn't have refrigerators. So you and your workplace and where you live and your marriage and your family, are you enhancing the life of those around you through acts of service that are sacrifices and pleasing to God? And then it says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on the stand where it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see wait a minute, Dan, I thought there's a scripture in there that says I'm not supposed to let my right hand know what my left hand is doing. In other words, I'm supposed to do all these good deeds in secret. No. You're supposed to do it in secret if it's about you. 
If the motivation is about shining a light on you, then yes, because God will reward what is done in secret because he knows he's, you're doing it for unto him. But he actually wants us to share, to do good deeds and shine it out for all to see, not so that they, we can get heaped the praise, but so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. That's what we're supposed to do. So we are supposed to share. Look what God did in joy to the world. Look what God's doing in the community through this church. Not because pat, 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 look at us and we're so good. No, look what God is doing through his church, through his people. So yes, we'll continue to shine lights on those things. And just like in Christmas Eve services, when you darken the room, the darker the room gets, a simple candle can light up an entire area. In the same way, for some of us who are freaking out, 2024 campaigns, you know, political campaigns, all the messiness that's gonna come this year, no, we get to be brighter and shine a light that's even greater as priests for God. So as priests, salt and light in the home, in the workplace, neighborhood, social media, I know that one might be really hard for some of you, um, salt and light wherever we may be. Now, as people bringing a message to others on behalf of God. This is why Acts 1-8, before Jesus ascended up into heaven, he says, you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you're gonna be my witnesses. Priests, this is what you're supposed to do. Tell people about me everywhere, because that's what priests do. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Priests share good news. Are we willing, as we go into 2024, to say, yep, I'm gonna write down somebody's name over the baptistry? Because every time somebody gets baptized, I'm gonna be praying for somebody. I'm gonna be praying fervently for somebody. I'm gonna be sharing, finding opportunities that God's gonna give me because I am first, my identity is in Christ as a child of God, but I am a priest for God wherever I work. I am not a businessman or a teacher or somebody who's working in the social sector or wherever it may be. First, you are a priest for God first. If you're a Christian, his will, not ours. So you get to shine a light for him and to tell people about him everywhere through our words and through our deeds. Last thing. So priests go to God on behalf of others. Priests go to others on behalf of God. And the last thing I wanna mention is that we are called as priests to disciple God's people. To disciple God's people. The Old Testament term would have been a shepherd, someone to care for the flock you know, someone who pours into others so that when people come to faith, we're all on this journey becoming more like him. That's why Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, this as priests is what we're supposed to do. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you and be sure of this, you're not alone. I'm with you always. That's what the Holy Spirit's there for, even to the end of the age. So what is a disciple? One last story before we close. Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee and there were these fishermen who were cleaning up their nets after a long night of fishing and they knew Jesus. They had heard Jesus talk before where he wasn't unfamiliar to them and he looks at them and he just says this simple phrase, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, in the invitation is the definition of what a priest does to disciple others. See, a priest follows Jesus. Follow me. We're following Jesus. The next part, I love it. Jesus says, I will make. It's not on us to become more like Jesus. It's our job to follow Jesus. He does the transforming from the inside out. I can't make myself more patient or kind, you know, or self-control or any of those things. But when I spend time with Jesus, he makes me. And I will make you priests, fishers of men, living for him in a world that desperately needs him helping others on their journey to become like him. That's what it means to fish for men. So as we go into 2024, how can you embrace your role and opportunity to be a priest for Jesus this week? Maybe that's just enough to start thinking, huh, I'm not just a Christian, I'm not just a child of God, I'm a priest. I'm a priest for God. And just begin to live that in 2024 to wear that banner because that's what God sees us as, his people, priests, going to God on others' behalf, going to others on God's behalf, and going on a discipleship journey in our own life and helping others do the same. May this be a year we can look back and say, God, whether you come this year or not, we embraced being the priesthood of all believers. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this beginning of Revelation. 
I just pray, Father, that you would just uh, allow the, the prayers in this room to be heard from you and that you would just lead anyone in here who does not yet know you to receive you as Lord and Savior. Father, 2024, we give to you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close, as always, we want to give you the opportunity to accept Christ. That's step one, is to choose to follow him as Savior and Lord. And if that's your decision, I want to encourage you to head to the cross. Maybe your next decision is to be baptized. You're like, man, I've actually not even taken that next step. I, I believe in Jesus, but I've not done that. Maybe God encouraged or challenged you over Christmas time. And you're like, yep, 2024 is going to be about him. I want you to head over there. But maybe you're somebody like, you know what? I need to pray. I need to go to them and they're going to join me in praying for someone else because I need to go and we need to do this together. I want to encourage you to do all of that during this song. And here's our first chance, right? What are we about to do? Sing? No. We get to bring a sacrifice of praise to God. And then starting next week, we come ready. 2024. Every week, I'm here to bring a sacrifice of praise to you. Will you stand with me as we sing, as we sing and praise him together?